Amen. One more time. Can we give our graduates a great big hand? <laughs> My wife and I, we didn't come up. Uh, we, we knew the layout of the order of the service, so we knew we had a few that was going to speak already. Um, but I want to say something, something to all three of our graduates, whether it's Brother Randy graduating with a master's or uh, Mackenzie and Walt graduating high school. Uh, I want to say that, you know, what, whether we've known you just for a couple of years or whether we've known you the whole time we've been here, each one of you have played a vital part in our life and our ministry here at Northwoods Church. And uh, you didn't only just graduate high school. I, I want to let you know right now that's not the only accomplishments you have. You have played a vital part in seeing souls saved in this place. And, and uh, that, that could, couldn't be more spoken of for that. Each of you, as Pastor Ryan and uh, your parents and, and friends would agree, have servant hearts, and uh, you guys are committed. When you set your eyes to something, um, you don't give up. Every time something hard take, comes up, you keep pressing in. And sometimes sometimes God will part the seas, and sometimes he'll give you the ability to walk on water. But I'm just thankful to be able to have served with you guys. And uh, I don't want it to sound like this is the end of our journey together because I prayerfully, I know, uh, you know, you may go off to college or whatever, but uh, we would love to continuously be praying for you guys and um, be there for you when we can and be there for your families as well. Um, and if you're not leaving Thomasville, of course, we want to see you here at Northwoods Church. We love each and every one of you. And Brother Randy, you've been here long enough. You ain't allowed to leave. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, we are just so thankful for each and every one of you. So thank you guys so much, not only for what you've done in your own personal lives and accomplishing your own personal lives, but thank you for what vital piece you've played in Northwoods Church being able to accomplish the mission that it's been able to accomplish thus far. So give yourselves a big hand. And church, can we agree with them and give them a big hand also? <clears throat> I have a, very, a fairly short sermon, and I, I don't say that jokingly. Um, this morning, I didn't want to keep you very long due to uh, it being graduation Sunday. And I know some of you may want to go eat lunch and spend some time with family. Um, but I do have a word that I believe is very um, very beneficial to those that have graduated, but there's not a single person in this room that this word can apply to. If you, if you will allow it, I promise you it is beneficial to each and every one of us. Um, but one thing that I, I do believe, and, and it goes with my sermon, but I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag on this one, is, you know, in statistics, when you ask a church full of people that attend a big church, when I say a big church, I'm talking 400 plus members, um, and you ask them, why do they attend this church? In statistics, statistically, one out of every 400 would tell you that they attend because it's big. But out of those that leave a big church, the statistics are much higher. And I don't know a number, so I'm not going to give you one, but they are much higher when asked why they left the church to say that church is just too big for me. I got lost. I didn't feel like there was anywhere I could plug in. I didn't feel like there was anything for me. It was just too big, much more. And what I've come to, come to share with you, and, I, and, I, and please bear with me this morning as I, as I teach you something this morning on being different. It's okay to be different. How many understand it's okay to be different? It's okay not to fit in. And, and as a matter of fact, if I could go further, I would even dare you to be different. To our graduates, I would dare you not to just look at the mold of what, what society says you're supposed to do on your next step. And I would dare you to be different and to stand out. And what I what reason I brought that statistic up is to tell you that the, the world is not looking for a bigger church. The world is not looking for an attractive church. The world is not looking for anything that just gives you what the world already offers, but the, the, the true hurt, heart hurt people are looking for a church that is true, church that has the fruit of the Word of God, amen, and, and I said that, the reason I brought that out to you a little bit earlier is because I was asked this morning for someone to share just for a moment something that happened in their life, I'm going to ask Sister Melissa to come and she's going to share with us, the reason I said I would do it before the sermon is because uh, probably about three and a half years ago, I believe it was, maybe a little longer than that, when Sister Melissa started coming to church here, uh, we began praying uh, for restoration for her family. And uh, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen the next Sunday. 
But I'm here, I want to show you and I want to show our graduates and I want to show each and every one of us sitting in this room that persistently praying and not giving up, the process is the most important thing of it all. So I'm going to let Sister Melissa take just a moment and share uh, what God has done in her life this past weekend. So if anybody knows me or anything about my story, um, in 2010 my kids were taken because their father tried to kill me. Um, the state put them up for adoption. After that, I went down a bad road of meth addiction. Five overdose, well, sorry, nine overdoses and five suicide attempts. About a year ago, my son came back, my 19-year-old. He came back broken. He's been tossed around a little bit, but he also graduated high school out of Thomas County Central yesterday. And um, I'm not allowed to see my 17-year-old daughter. She adopted parents, so no, she's not able to come see her. I have seen my oldest daughter. So God has slowly been working. Um, yesterday, I hosted a graduation party, but my son and daughter came back, so I was not allowed to. I, I was supposed to exit um, until they left. So I went over to my niece's house. Well, my niece came in the door. I was sitting on the couch, and she said, TT, your daughter wants to see you. I got to hold my baby girl and smell her hair and tell her that I love her and that I'm sorry. So if God can take something like that, because I was the worst of the worst. I was 90 years old. In three years, I will celebrate three years clean in January. In them three years, I gave my life to Christ. All he asks is for you to surrender. He'll do the rest. And if there's hope for me, there's hope for everybody. But um, it is a process. And... Um, just yesterday, God, everything was so confused, and God said, no, that's not the way this is going to happen. It is time. So the bad chapter of my story is over. So I just, I knew somebody needed to hear this, that's out there, that's addicted, that's hopeless. There's hope. He loves you. He loves you. And you know, the Bible says God's not a respecter of persons. And what he does for me, what he does for Sister Melissa, what he does for one or the other, he'll do it for anyone that is trusting in his unchanging word. Amen. I want to jump right into it this morning in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to read with you verses 13 through 22. And it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the, to the end for the grace that is to be brought up unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your so yearning here in fear. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily has foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who by, whom, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now I want to read to you verses, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 
Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Will you stretch your hands? Pray for me as I pray for you. Most wonderful and loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this weekend, Lord. We thank you for our graduates. We thank you for all those that have graduated, Lord, and moving into the next chapter of their life. We thank you for the blessings and the testimonies, Lord God. We just ask that you would continue to unfold your, yourself into each and every one of their lives, Father, into each and every one of our lives as we step day by day, Lord, for you. We ask, Lord, that you would let me decrease this morning that you might increase and let the words of my speech God be an edification to you and we give you the praise the honor and the glory in Christ's most holy name we pray amen again I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning on the subject different being different you know we have the we have the idea and the understanding that to be different is a bad thing to be different I mean if you are a baseball player and you wear a football helmet to practice, you're going to be different. And that's probably not a whole lot of good that you could say about someone wearing a football helmet at a baseball practice. That's just being different in its kind of way. To be different, uh, you know, in the world would be, the, what the world calls different is anything that opposes what the world wants. That's being different. And, you know, that would be a good thing as a Christian believer. It's good that I'm different and I don't want what the world wants, that I don't have the same voting styles as the world has. I don't have the same desires to see bills pass as the world sees because I know what the Word of God says. It's okay to be that kind of different. So to say be different is a very vague statement. So I want to show you a little bit this morning about what I mean. But before I do, I want to share with you uh, a piece of a novel wrote, written by C.E. Montague called Rough Justice. There's a memorial, a memorable scene that describes a little boy named Bron going to church for the first time with his governess. He watches with interest every part of the service. The preacher climbs into the high pulpit and Bron hears him tell some terrible news. It is about a brave and kind man who was nailed to a cross, terribly hurt a long time ago. And even today still feels a dreadful pain even now because there is something not done that he wants them all to do. Little Bron thinks that the preacher is telling the story because a lot of people are there and they're going to do something about this. Bron is sitting impatiently on the edge of the pew. He can hardly wait to see what the first move will be in righting this horrible injustice. But he sits quietly and decides that after the service someone will do, surely do something about it. And little Bron begins to weep, but nobody else seems at all upset. The service is over, and the people walk away as if they had not heard such terrible news and as if nothing remarkable had happened. As Bron leaves the church, he is trembling. So his governess looks at him and says, Bron, don't take it to heart. Someone will think you are different. If you act like the story of this innocent man dying on a cross bothers you, people are going to think you're different. If you walk out of the church crying all the time, people are going to think you're different. If you walk out of here feeling like you've got a burden to do something in the world and change in the community, people are going to think you are different. What does it mean to be different then? To the world, it means that you are to be alive and sensitive to one's spirit. That's being different. To be different means to show emotion. If you show emotion, you're different. You're, you're out of the box. You're, 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 you're weak. To be different means to listen to what is going on in God's house and to not just hear it, but to respond to it. The Bible even says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be ye doers also. To be different means to take Jesus Christ seriously. But what I am afraid has happened is the church has become so casual about Jesus Christ. Everything in the world has become casual. And I was reading, I was telling them, you can get on a lot of rabbit trails when you're doing this study. I struggled getting through this study because it's, everything's such an argument when it comes to talking about how to live a godly life. Um, but I did agree with this one point. Have you, do you remember the days when you used to go to work, business, a business, and then on, and every now and then throw, they throw in that casual Friday, and everybody just loved it because you got to kind of dress down. Well, we live in a world where every day is casual Friday. 
We live in a world, but it's, it's to the point, and, and that's, not, that's not heat or miss. I don't care if you wear a three-piece suit or if you wear a, a, a blue jeans and a, and a dress shirt or what you wear. That doesn't bother me one bit. What does bother me is when we hear about sinners dying and going to hell, but because we don't want to be different and we don't want to change our lives or we don't want people to look at us any different than they look at anyone else, we choose to sit back and let the status quo continue to unfold, which is exactly why we have the world that we have today, where people don't know if they, what dressing room they're supposed to use, and people don't know whether a baby's a living vessel inside the mother or outside the mother. People don't don't know if when they're born are they biologically boys or are they biologically girls or is that a choice that they make later down the road we're living in the era because so many people don't want to be different they just want to fit the status quo they want to fit into what and what's happened is because we live in such a social media driven world name name one, I mean just think about this for a minute why does a person have a social media page is it because they want to get on there quickly and show the whole world how they're different? Or do you see 500 selfies? You know, they go to Winter Ramp, or they go to youth conference, or they go to camp meeting, and they got all these selfies, and it's not anything to do with the Lord. It's, look at me jumping on the front stage. Look at these new kicks I got down here in front of Jensen Franklin. Look at my new era. It's, it's, it's become a me-centered world in a world that should be Christ-centered. But should Christians be different? Ought not we to be distinct, separate, not the same, and out of the ordinary, even unusual? Because Christ was distinct. He was unusual. He was out of the ordinary. That's why people wouldn't accept him as the Savior, because he was not a kingly-looking person. He didn't look like culture. The biblical word for holy describes the contemporary word different. When he says, be ye holy for I am holy, he said, be you different. Because I am different. There's even one writer that goes on to say that, you know, and the mercy is in his bowels and, in his, and, and his grace is in his sight, but it is his beauty that is his holy. If you'll go back and read the story of when Moses looked on the hinder parts of God, the Bible says his face glistened when he come down off the mountain. It was still sparkling and glistening. because, And all he seen was the hinder parts of God when he hid, hid him in the cleft of the rock. As he came down, he was glistening because he had seen the beauty and the holiness of God. I'm here to tell you today, the world may not tell you, that may make you feel like that. And even in our own understanding, we may think this can't be the way, but there is no nothing more beautiful there is nothing more pure than someone that is living a holy life someone that is living righteous someone that is living on purpose not because they're trying to blend in with the next crowd but someone that's willing to get out of the crowd and be a leader Someone that's willing to do something different. Different people are the reason you have electricity today. Different people are the reason you fly in airplanes today. Different people are the reason you drive cars today. Because it was somebody that says, I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm not just going to live and breathe and eat and die. I'm going to change something. I'm going to be something out of the ordinary. you got to be different. A holy person has a quality about their life that is unique. Their present lifestyle is not only changed from their past lifestyle, but it is set apart from the lifestyles of unbelievers. Now, we get the, the, the phrase, holier than thou. That's why we have such a casual church today. We actually will have church leaders that are more concerned with making sure they don't get titled holier than thou, that they've just cast down holiness altogether. They don't want anyone to judge them because they feel like they're different to be different doesn't mean you're better than someone else I'm set apart by my calling in God but I fall short every single day of my life I have to repent the same way you have to repent I have to ask for forgiveness and I have to forgive the same way you have to ask for forgiveness and forgive I have children that run me up the wall just like you have children that run you up the wall me and my wife we fight we bicker we can, we, we we don't get along all the time but guess what it doesn't mean that I'm not better than someone else it doesn't mean I'm better than someone else it just means I'm unique I'm different are you different are you different in the way that you carry your life or do you look at what's going on in culture to decide 
how you're going to, who you're going to be and how you're going to be it. Believers in Christ have been called to live this unique life and different lifestyle. Peter wrote, <coughs> he said, But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all of your conduct. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Actually, the word called could actually be considered too passive of a word here. Because we have not just been called to be holy, we have been commanded to be holy. Called could be a little bit too passive because all of us have been called to ministry, but not everyone answers their call. But if you are going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus was unique, distinct, and set apart. He looked at, he said, if you are to be my follower, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You have to be set apart. It was a command. It wasn't an a, a question or a request. Being different is not a bad thing. Being different. I think back of the, of the story of Joseph. Joseph was different. Not only was he different um, in the physical sense or in the spiritual sense, he was different in the physical sense. He had a different mother. He had the, his mother was the one that was the beautiful one. His mother was the one, he was born of Rachel. He, so when he was born, he, his brothers already didn't like him. The Bible even tells us that when he went and showed his coat to his brothers, that the Bible says that they, and I'm going to paraphrase it, they didn't like him even more. Which means they didn't like him in the beginning because of other things. We could sit here and argue, was it wise for Joseph to go tell his dream to his brothers? And there's going to be some that say yay, there's going to be some that say nay. But the fact of the matter is, i got to give props to my man Joseph because he wasn't afraid to be different. He wasn't afraid, even though he knew his brothers hated his coat, he wore his coat every day. He wore his coat until they stripped it off of him and covered it in animal's blood. He didn't care what they thought about him. He, he cared about them, but he didn't care about their opinion of his coat see there's a difference between not caring what people think about you and not caring about people there's a, you can care about someone and not care about their opinions you know back when I was a child I was always told opinions are like noses everybody has them and some of them are too big I've also been told other things about opinions everybody has one and some of them stink but I'm just going to let you figure that part of it out you have a choice whether you're going to have a married or a single life. But you should never consider the choice of whether you're going to have a holy life. That should be automatic. But what is the problem with being different? The reason, it isn't the fact that someone just wakes up and says, I want to be saved, but I don't want to be different. No, the reason that people don't want to be different is because there's this stigma to being different that the world has placed. One of the problems with being different is, you know, we value conformity. We don't want to stand out from the crowd. We don't want people, we don't want to draw any attention. You know, and sometimes that can be a good thing. But when we're talking about serving the Lord, we should want to draw attention. We should want people to want to hear what we have to say. We should want people to want to know who God is and who Christ is. One of the things that I even read out, going back to my statistic of what I said earlier, when I went through CAMS and when I started into the ministry, every word you got from a minister was always, the Lord, I see you standing among thousands of people. And man, that it excites people. That excites people because immediately I'm going to be on a big stage, I'm going to be preaching to thousands of people. And then they get this big church mentality and they, they, they miss the journey they miss the opportunity to serve with the hand few, handful of disciples that God has sent you to build with and you just keep casting them off like that's not important I got to hurry up and get to my 2000 I got to hurry up and get to my word I got to hurry up and feel, fulfill my word and you, you, you're passing off the five people that's going to multiply to make the 2000 we're, we're getting focused on the 2000 we're getting focused on the big dream and we're losing the little dream we're getting focused on the, on the big size and, and the big scene, and we're losing the fact that we're able to have a be a difference in a room two people. We visualize a caricature of holiness. We don't like the idea of holiness because we think it communicates an attitude and it displays actions that have become as holier than thou. 
We disdain a spirituality and a behavior that puts one on a pedestal as being better than the rest. But Jesus despised this type of mentality and morality in the Pharisees. He constantly told them. He constantly got on to them. For number one, you're trying to, you're, what you're accusing other people as being holier than thou, you're, you're the one that's guilty of it. You're the one judging the one that you're calling holy. You're the one that's saying, because you're not willing to do the bad things I do, you just think you're better than me. See, all it is is it's reverse psychology, and the world has, has mastered this reverse psychology to where if I tell you you're guilty of doing something, even though what you're doing is in good deed, that I can make you quit doing your deed so that I feel more comfortable where I'm at, and you can't make me feel conviction. If you tell me that what I'm doing is wrong because what I'm doing is wrong, then you're wrong. Does that make sense to you? That's the world we live in. If what I'm doing is a sin and you tell me it's a sin, that makes you a sinner. You should welcome me. And we've got this philosophy in the church that we've got to co corral the church together. and We've got to accumulate ideas and fashions and designs so that we can draw in unbelievers. So if we can just get them here, we can make them believe. That's what we want to do. We just want to draw unbelievers in and make them believe, right? That's not what the church is for. Listen to me. That's not what the church is for. The church is here to disciple. When he gave the great commission, he said, go make disciples for my name's sake. In other words, when you come to church, this is a place where believers accumulate together, assimilate together, and you teach them discipleship, and they grow and they mature. And then when they walk out of the doors, they go and they disciple, they, 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 they win lost people to Christ, and what was once an unbeliever is brought through the doors to be edified and built up. But the church should never get rid of its holiness to make it a feasible place for a sinner to feel comfortable. If an unbeliever walks, all unbelievers are welcome in the church. Hey, I want you to make sure you hear what I'm saying. Unbelievers are welcome in the church. But the church should never sacrifice its holiness and its purity and its righteousness so that the unbeliever has a comfortable seat in the house of God. Never should a worldly person sit in the house of God and feel comfortable. There should be conviction. There should be, there should be anger building up in an unbeliever's heart or either conviction. Anger is going to build up in the one that knows they don't want to change, that's not willing to change, that will never hear truth and just refuses to hear truth and is already made up in their mind, when I get out of here, y'all will never see me in this place again. And that's okay because God is going to have to work on them in another time and in another place. But when we come to the house of God, when they came to the temple of God, Jesus didn't walk in there and say, all right, everybody, did you get milk and cookies before you sat down? If you would like to, we'll put on a movie over here. We'll put on a, a strip tease movie over here because I want to make sure all of you guys stay and when we get done we'll play a little we'll play a little game and and if you guys will stay with us then then if at the end of it if we're good I'll pray for you no Jesus walked in and immediately they would begin to read from the scrolls they would read from the scrolls and they would teach the, the, the word of God and they would teach salvation and they would teach biblical statutes and they would teach the commandments and they would teach those things. It wasn't a concern because what you learn in this house, this is where we mess up. We wait here for unbelievers to get saved. So then someone steps up and says, well, if, if this is the only place we're ever going to get an unbeliever, we've got to do something to get them here. No, where we went wrong is when the church quit leaving the doors and go in to have church out there. See, you come here to have church. You go out there to be church. We come here to worship God, not us. Not us. We, when we come into this house, it's not, it shouldn't be about, well, I don't like that kind of music. I, that's just, them drums are just too loud. I don't like that contemporary stuff. I wish they, I don't like that old school stuff. First off, God is not a God. He's, he's, not, he's not limited by time. If it was holy to God in 1800, it's still holy to God in 2021. If it's holy to God in 2021, it would have worked for those in 1800. What I'm getting at is we don't come to this church to get what we want because we're, we're, we're like the rest of the world. If you, you know, we go to Burger King to get it our way. You go to a restaurant and the customer's always right. 
But when you come to the house of God, we come to service, Sunday service, which means we come to serve one another and serve the Lord and to exalt his name, to be holy and righteous and above all others, amen. And when you serve God, you get rid of conformity. The Bible says do not be conformed to this world, but be re changed, be, be, be renewed by the, or be changed by the renewing of your mind. Even Paul told us at the beginning, or Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13, he says, how do you change or how do you become different? It starts in the mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Another reason, another problem that we have in being different is we visualize, or I'm sorry, we misunderstand what it means to be holy. To additional Add an additional weight to our reasons for not living a life of holiness is because it conjures up images of being a monk or a priest. Oh, if I'm going to be holy, I got to live way over here in the church. I got to ask Pastor Josh if I can have a, a put a bed back there behind the baptistry so I can live in the church, and I got to wear all my robes, and I got to walk around with humming sounds for the rest of my life, and I, I can't show up down there at Victorian Christmas because that, that won't be holy. That's 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 for the birds. You ought to want to go to Victoria and Christmas. You ought to want to get down there in the street and tell somebody about Jesus. Being holy doesn't mean you're going to just, you're just going to fall off the face of the earth. What good is it to be holy if you ain't allowed to talk to nobody and tell them about Jesus? But the, the mentality is, is we miss, or we, what happens is we misunderstand what being holy is. Being holy, yeah, I'm not going to go sit in a bar with you and talk with you about Jesus. But I, if you're in a bar and you need to hear about Jesus, call me. I'll come pick you up and I'll talk to you all the way home about it. I'm not going to come sit in a bar because I don't want my good being evil spoken of. I don't want someone relating me, my ministry, to bars. But I will, I will pick you up any day of the week from a bar. I will pick you up any day of the week from your, from the, from your drug house or wherever you're being. And I will tell you about Jesus along the way. And I'm not going to not sit in a bar with you because I'm holier than you or I'm better than you. I'm not going to sit in a bar there because I know that I'm better than myself. I'm better than who I used to be. And a bar is where I used to be. And I'm not that guy anymore. So I'm going to respect where you've been. You respect where I've been. And we're not going to judge one another for it. Let me judge where I need to be. You judge where you need to be because the Bible says in Peter that he is not a respecter of persons, but he judges all men according to his works. So if we'll all let that happen, then I won't be mad at someone that's maybe living a more stricter life than me. And I could even maybe take some notes. And then there's other people that may be so strict and it's unbearable, and guess what? Maybe they could take some notes from a family that knows how to live life. But being holy isn't about what Pastor Ryan thinks of me. Being holy isn't about what Brother Randy thinks of me. Being holy is setting myself apart to be used by God. The meaning of being different, it means that we think differently. He said to be different begins with the proper preparation of our minds. Peter uses a Middle Eastern analogy to describe how one is to prepare their minds. During this time, men wore long flowing robes. And when they were preparing to run or do a physical labor, they would pull up their robes and they would tie them around their waist so that it would give their legs more freedom to move. He is telling us today that we are, and today we would use the expression, Peter used it the way he used it, but today it would be more like simply saying, roll up your sleeves. When I roll up my sleeves, that means I'm about to get, you know, we're we finna get dirty, we're we finna work, we're finna do some lifting, we're finna do whatever. And that's what it means to be different is, okay, I've come into the house of God. I've heard the word of God like, like this child did. When he heard the word of God, immediately he knew that everybody is hearing the same story I'm hearing. But what he didn't know is those people had known that story for so long that it was casual to them to hear about Jesus dying on the cross. It wasn't a big deal anymore because every preacher says it and every church says it. It wasn't a big deal because they always hear about it. But for Bron, it was something new for him. And he was, a, it was, he was contemplating his mind that surely these people are gathered together because they're going to do something about this at the end of this service. This story cannot end with this man dying and still being in pain today. 
He's not in pain because of the cross. He's not in pain because of the whips, lashes upon his back. He's not in pain because of the crowns of thorns upon his head. But how many times when he knows that his blood has been shed for freely for anyone who would receive it to be saved and set free, but yet there are people walking by his blood and never accepting it day in and day out. That's why he still hurts. So as we sit here and we wonder, especially for our graduates, you're fixing to step out into a world and you're going to make some big decisions. You can make the decision to say, okay, it's easy to go this route. I'm just going to go this route because it's simple. Or you could be the one that says, I'm going to be different. And it's not just for our graduates. It doesn't matter if you're 4 or 40. It doesn't matter if you're 70 years old. You can make the decision today that says, I'm going to be different. Whether you've got 10, 20, 30 years left on this earth, you can be different for the rest of that time. Because being different is not a bad thing. You can make a difference. Because let me tell you something about being different. People will always accept what is the same. But they will eventually respect what is different. They will always accept, they will always agree, they will always be in, in hand with someone that is the same as always been. But if you'll give it time, down the road, they will respect what is different. How many people do you think looked around at Mr. Ford and said, you are a lunatic. What's wrong with our horses and buggies? We've been doing this for how long and ain't had a problem. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, you fool. And he's over here building stuff and the wheels are falling off and the motors are blowing up and he's got grease on his fingernails and cuts in his hands and he looks like a crazy man. But how many of them ran down to the car lot and traded in their finest buggy to get them a brand new car to ride down the road and, and cut half the distance off? They didn't have a whole lot of respect for him in the beginning because it wasn't working yet. He was just different. But they respected his difference when his being different paid off for them. We would use this expression, roll up our sleeves. Behavioral scientists have discovered the human behavior, that human behavior is determined to a great extent by the subconscious mind. The computer vocabulary graphically describes the potential of human behavior, garbage in, garbage out. In the same way, to be different begins with our minds. Our minds must be holy if our behavior is going to be holy. You cannot feed your mind garbage and expect to live a holy life. You cannot let people dump into your mind garbage if you expect to live a garbage life, I mean a, a, a holy life. Uh, and churches, this, my dad spoke on this a while back, uh, a week or two ago, or I think it was in our Bible study. We go back to our hometown. It's a small county. And you don't go there, you don't hear about the county commissioners fighting it out. You don't hear about what farmer don't like the other farmer. You don't hear about what drug dealer don't like the other drug dealer. You don't hear about what gang don't like the other gang. Do you know where the drama is in, our home, in my home county? It's in churches. Because you got the merry-go-round of churches. You ain't got but a handful of them. So when someone gets mad at this one, they run to that one. They get mad at that one, they run to this one. And, and sooner or later, they, and when, by the time they make it around, this pastor done left, so they can go try that one out again. It's just a, it's for, for my whole life up there, that's what it was. But it, it blows my mind. But why is that? Because you can't live a holy life from a mind that's been eating and feeding on garbage. And there's a reason that first, uh, I'm sorry, that Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 20 said, There are seven things which God hates, six which are an abomination. One of them is gossip. If people putting garbage in your ears you can say well I'm just going to be supportive I'm just going to listen I'm not going to let it change if the standard isn't set immediately then there's an understanding that you agree if you don't set the standard that this is not for me I can't do this then whether you say you agree or whether you don't the understanding is that you agree and to be different you have to be able to cut that off and it's not just in churches. When you're with your family, 
and, and, and you're, you're trying to encourage your family, or you have belief in a family member that keeps failing, and you've got the world or somebody else saying, oh, they're never going to be anything. You've got a choice to make. You can let them talk down about your family member or your friend saying that they'll never recover, or you can remember where you came from, and you can let them know, look, this is not, you're not going to talk like this to me. I have faith, and I believe that they're able to do it, not in their own strength, but in the strength of the one I pray to, and that's God himself, Jesus Christ, that is able to raise them up. As the musicians come at this time and I get ready to, to land this plane, I'm daring you to be different. What does it mean to be different? Your diff, your, your, whatever you may be different in, maybe it, it, it'll be different because of how you look. Maybe it'll be different because of what you preach. Maybe it'll be different because of how you carry yourself at work. Maybe you'll be different because of the songs you're going to write or the messages you're going to write or the books you're going to write or the songs you're going to sing. What, are you, what is going to make you different? Can I tell you that whatever is different about you may be the very thing that sets God's sights on you? I'm reminded of a, of a, of a little short man in the Bible. The Bible says Jesus is walking with a multitude of people. And there's this man named Zacchaeus. He's too short. He can't see over the crowd. He, he can't get to Jesus. And it was never about a, a, a self-centered emotion. And it was never about being self-centered. And see, the issue with a lot of things today in churches is it's always about me and I. Even in some of our songs, it's about I want to feel you. I want to love you. I want to be there. I did you. It's supposed to be about God. And it's about I's and me's and us's and we's and not God anymore. But anyhow, getting back to that, Zacchaeus did didn't get up in that tree because he said, I need to be seen. I, I want God to know who I am before he gets by me. I, I, no, he just wanted to be accepted by God and he would do anything he needed, but he knew he was short. He was different because he was short. He was different in his physical nature. But what made him different is that he didn't let the surrounding crowds keep him from getting in. Other people was just joining in with the crowds thinking, oh, look at me. I'm walking with Jesus. Look, look, y'all can see him over my head taking selfies and putting them on Instagram. Instagram and putting them on TikTok and doing this other stuff. They just joining in with the crowds just walking. But then there's this little short man named Zacchaeus who said, no, I need a blessing from the Lord. I need a blessing. I need my life to be changed. What I've been doing ain't been working and I need to be radically shifted. He climbs up into a tree and out of all of those people there, Jesus notices the, notices the short man in the tree, Zacchaeus, and he calls him down. He stays with him. He, he, he dwells with him. He abodes with him. Why? Because what was was different, brought sight, brought image, brought vision to God's eyes. Your vision, your dreams are going to be different. Every one of us in here, our dreams are different. Whether we're talking spiritually or we're talking physically. If we went around our graduates right now and say, what is your dream? You know, they may tell us about their, what their dream job is. Maybe their dream is to have a family and a couple kids and live on a farm with a pond and and all oh, that's great. But your dream doesn't become a reality until you do something different. To just think about it won't give it to you. To just declare it won't make it happen. But the moment you do something different. You went from being a dreamer to being someone that lives in the reality of it. How many times have you ever dreamed, Lord, I just want to get back to the days when we laid hands on the sick and they recovered. Lord, I want to get back to the place where when the altar calls were given, people were radically changed and filled with the Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to get back to the place. Lord, my dream, my dream is to, is to see people go down to the altar. And when they leave, they leave their addictions on an altar. They leave their addictions on an altar. They leave their problems on an altar. And they go restore their marriages. And they go restore their families. And they go restore their friendships. And they go restore their jobs. And they go restore their businesses. Not for their own sake, but for Christ's sake. Or how many of them, how many of you ever... Going to the physical realm, ever say, Lord, I have a dream to be a business owner. I have a dream to, to be a successful leader. I dare you to be different. Don't get in with the rest of the crowd. 
Don't get in with the rest. Yes, the whole world. There's nothing wrong. I want to make sure I say that from earlier. There's nothing wrong with growing a big church. But I want to tell you, that's not what's going to save people. Is hurry up and get into a big church. I don't care. I don't want anything. I, I don't care nothing about the celebrity pastor status. I don't care if I'm ever seen on Facebook. I don't care if I'm ever seen on videos. I don't, I don't care about any of that. What I care about is that when people come up three and a half years later and say, what we've been praying about, I feel God's making a restoration. My daughter asked to be with me. Or having a man come up for prayer and saying they gave me, they didn't give me but six months to live. And two years later, he's cancer free. Or seeing a young man in the back that just came to me a few minutes ago and said, my gut, my, my leukemia, my cancer, it's not there. It's still in remission. It's not in my bones anymore. That's what's going to grow a church is when people are getting saved, people are getting healed, when children and prodigal sons and daughters are coming home because the church binds together and refuses to pray and refuses to give up and refuses to let the world win over our children, over our nation, and over our politicians. Amen. If you want to see revival in this church, if you want to see revival in this nation, it's not going to be by who you vote in. It's going to be by who you pray in. Amen. Will you stand all over the house this morning? I want to share one more little story I come across before we pray. There was this young boy. Him and his dad had watched the Olympics and his, they watched the divers. And this little boy was amazed at how them divers would come out and they would jump and their bodies would go into almost a perfect V and before they would hit the water they would straighten out and they would go into the water and barely make a single splash and that little boy was determined I'm going to learn how to dive like that well one day they go to the gym and they go to the pool and the dad gets out of the pool and he's back there changing the little boy is just standing out there and there's this man standing there, and he's watching him. And he sees this little boy talk his to, talking to himself like the announcers. And he's walking out to the edge, and he, he jumps, and he says, I noticed this little boy, he would jump, and he would, he would form like this perfect V. And right before he would hit the water, it'd be like a perfect splash, like just very little. He said, I could tell this little boy had been training for years to do this. This guy didn't know that this boy had only watched it on TV, but he had been working in that pool because he had a dream that he could do it well then the daddy walks out he tells the little boy come on he said daddy I can jump I can dive just like that guy on the Olympics you know what his daddy said you'll never be able to do it like that buddy cause in his daddy's mind this is reality this is reality you'll never be able to jump like an Olympian diver and the man that's telling the story said, I watched that little boy. He said, that little boy was so sure. He was so intense. And he was so courageous when he was out there by himself and talking like he was the announcers and he would dive into that pool. He said, that, that boy could have done anything he wanted because he was intensely trying to accomplish it. He said, but his daddy told him, you'll never be able to do it. He said, I can do it. I can do it. He said, well, show me. So he, instead of letting him cl climb up there where he had learned to do it, he told him to do it on a sturdy platform, which didn't bounce. He said, you could see the excitement drain out of that little boy. And when he dove, he done the V perfect. But he didn't get enough height off the water. And when he hit the water, he just looked like a clobbered mess. And when he got out, his daddy looked at him and said, ain't nothing wrong with trying, boy, but I told you, you'll never be able to do it like him. He said, I witnessed with my own eyes in a matter of moments a boy going from believing that he can not only desire to accomplish, but he can accomplish. I watched him accomplish what he set out to accomplish. And in a matter of moments, I watched it taken away from him. He was no longer sure of what he could do. Can I tell you that when you step out and be different, I would be doing you a great injustice if I told you it was going to be easy. When you step out to be different, there's going to be people standing at the pool saying you'll never be able to do it like that Olympian. You'll never be able to do it like that guy. You'll never own a business as big as this guy. You'll never pastor and go as far as this guy. You'll never be able to sing as good as this person. 
There's always going to be people that are going to be there saying that. But it doesn't matter if you do or if you don't, they're still going to be there saying that. So you might as well do it and prove them wrong. You might as well do it not just to prove people wrong, but to prove that your God is able and he can use you. What does it mean to be holy or to be different? It doesn't mean that you got to walk out of here and you got to look like a sore thumb all the time. Because I grew up in holiness. I grew up in a holiness church. I grew up in the gifts and the ministering of the Holy Spirit. And I've been to theme parks. I've been to ball parks. I've been on vacation. I've been whitewater rafting. If I could lose a few pounds, I'd be skydiving. They told me I was too fat for that. But it doesn't mean that you got to walk out and you got to look like a monk at El Jalisco after church. But it does mean you'll talk differently. It does mean you operate differently. It does mean when everybody else says, this is the end, COVID has come, this is the end, that, that you have the ability to step up and say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul Amen. for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. For thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. When everybody else, even the doctors, look at you and say, there's nothing we can do. That's when you are to say, by his stripes, I am healed. Amen. Yes. I am healed. Well, what happens if they don't get healed and they die? That's when you are to say, Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It don't matter if I wake up dead, I'm still on the winning side, amen. It don't matter if I wake up here or if I wake up there, I'm still on the winning side. When you are a holy child of God, when you have been grafted into the holy children of Israel, when you have been grafted by the blood of Jesus Christ into a saved family of believers, there is nothing. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of your Father. The Bible says no man can pluck you out of the hand of God. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to embarrass you this morning. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to ask you to come talk. I'm just going to ask you to be real with yourself right here before the Holy Spirit. This is just between you and God. It isn't for the whole world to give you a patty cake. It wasn't for the whole church to make them, you know, a, a scene out of you. This is just between you and God. If you're here this morning and you say, God, I want to be different. Lord, when people see me, I want them to see you. Lord, I want to be different. I want to be peculiar. I want to be set apart. That when, 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 when I should have been angry, people see you because I'm not getting angry like I used to. I'm not reacting like I used to. I'm not hurting people like I used to. I'm not quitting like I used to. I'm not giving up like I used to. I'm not accepting the evil, evil, evil reports like I used to. I want to be different, God. And I want to bring hope to other people. I want to be different. And I want to lead other people. I want to be different. And I want to show people that there is a, there is a way. There is a way that is higher than our own ways, Lord. I, I want to be different, God. And I want to go to the one that is higher than I. I want to be different. I want to be changed, Lord. I want to teach everyone about the love of Jesus Christ, whether it be by my words or simply by my lifestyle. I want people to know that you live, Lord. I want to be different. If that's you this morning, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. This is just between you. Will you just slip your hand up and just let, let the Lord know, I want to be different, Lord. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lamb of God. You can put your hands down. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful because I believe with all of my heart that you being different is not going to be what causes you to fall. It's going to be what causes you to gain the respect of those that will follow you. When I was in the military, from an E1 to an E4, you hung out. It didn't matter if you was an E4, E3, E2, E1. Everybody just talked about the same thing, did the same thing. But when I got promoted to sergeant, I was able to maintain a relationship with my men. But I had to be different. I had to be different. I couldn't condone some of the things I would have formerly condoned. Because I needed them to respect my leadership. I had to be different. I couldn't go some of the places they were going. Because I had to set an example and be an example for them to move up to be the leaders they were called to be. And if I was willing to do that for the military, how much more should we do that for the Lord? Who calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I'm going to ask them to sing a song for us this morning. These altars are going to be open. If you have anything weighing on your life right now, maybe something that was said in the message pricked your heart and you want prayer. Or maybe there's something that you've been fighting or dealing with and it's too much for you to bear. And you want to let us help you pray. These altars are open for any need that you might have. And I believe in the one that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask or think. He loves you. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did last night. It doesn't matter what you did 20 minutes ago. What matters is what you do right now. There's no distance you could have traveled that God can't bring you back in a moment. Amen. So I'm going to ask them to go. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask them to go into a song. And these altars are going to be open you have any need, it's, these altars are open. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your holiness. We thank you for it is beautiful to the eyes of the believer, Lord God. Lord, that we long to be like you, God. We long to chase after you, God. And one day, we're going to take off this corruptible and we're going to put in the incorruptible. And we are going to be holy just as you were holy. But today, God, spiritually speaking, we can already have that. We can already be holy. We can all, Our minds can already be transformed. Lord, our minds can already be prepared to be holy just as you were holy. And we're asking you today, God, to just bring in, Father, conviction. Bring in challenge. Bring in change. Let everyone know, God, that it is not of a fault of theirs, Lord God, because of their past. For we have all fell, fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned, Lord God. But Lord, that today is an opportunity for us to step into a new dimension and a new glory that says, God, I'm going to be different. I'm going to lead differently. I'm going to be a different businessman. I'm going to be a different pastor. I'm going to be a different church member. I'm going to be a different father. I'm going to be a different mother. I'm going to be a different son or daughter. I'm going to be a different youth, youth member. I'm going to be a different children's member. I'm going to be a different Lord. Whatever I do, a different delegate. I'm going to be a different community man. I'm going to be a different person in my neighborhood because I'm going to make a difference. Not for me, but for the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you in advance, Lord. We give you the praise and we give you the honor. We give you the glory in Christ's most holy name. Hallelujah. Amen. These altars are open.